for stopping in today to check out the video. Today we're coming to you from the Mills Fleet Farm Sports and Outdoor Show held at the legendary Lambeau Field. Hank Parker's just about ready to take the stage, so stay tuned to see what his seminar is all about. Where to start, and it's find food and cover. I did a deal a couple of years ago with Coca-Cola and the Bass Pro Shop, and they did a sweepstakes, went a fishing trip with Hank Parker. Well, when the sweepstakes was finished, we go to Beaver Lake in Arkansas in July. I can't catch a cold in Beaver Lake in Arkansas in July. It is horrible. So I go out there and I pre-fish and I don't get a bite. I fish all day. The day before my guys are going to come in, I'm going to fish with them the next morning. They think they want a fishing trip with Hank Parker to fish will come out their fins up. Well, I'm thinking we ain't going to get a bite. So uh, I talked to the guy at the marina and he said, let me tell you what happened. They had about four inches of rain up the river. Uh, so I bet you can find some muddy water, some off-colored water up that river. You may catch a fish or two up there. So when I got my, my two winners of the sweepstakes the next morning, we fired that ranger boat up and we took off and we drove for about 65 miles. Now these guys are thinking, what in the world is this guy doing? Uh, so we rode for about an hour and 10 minutes and we get up in the river and sure enough the water color is uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty muddy compared to the rest of the lake which was crystal clear looked about like this drinking water. Uh, but up there we're getting in some really off colored water. So I ran in this one bay and I came out and I ran in this other bay and I came out and I ran in the third bay and we started fishing. And we started catching fish. I was very surprised. Uh, but we caught them pretty good. And finally one of the guys asked me, he said, let me ask you something. Why in the world did we run this far? And I said, well, we came up here to find this off-colored water. He said, well, why did we fish in this bay and not the other two bays? They look exactly the same. I said, you're right, they do look the same. I said, the first bay we ran into, there were just a very few birds in there. Uh, the second bay, there were a few more birds, and we came in here and there's birds everywhere. He said, well, are we bird watching or are we fishing? <laughs> well, if you're going to find the bait, the birds are going to show you where the bait's at. You go in a, a bay and there's a bunch of blue herons standing on the bank, there's a bunch of kingfishers, a bunch of seagulls, you can bet one thing, there is a lot of bait in this area. So you find the bait. Then I just ask myself a simple question. What lure do I have that would most thoroughly fish this structure? We were in a bay that was pretty flat, pretty shallow, it was about eight or nine foot deep, so I had to select a bait that would be thorough to fish that type of, of water. So it's pretty simple to connect those dots. You say, well, why did you look for muddy water? Well, two things happen with muddy water. One, it forces fish that are deep, it fish forces them up shallow because the more off-colored the water is, the darker it is down underneath and the fish can't see. So it forces them up. Rising water, fish will always follow that water up. So you got rising water and muddy water, it makes the fish more predictable. Where are you going to find them? Instead of out there on those breaks, 18, 20 foot deep, they're going to be up there in three and four foot of water in the shallows. So they're a lot easier to catch. The more off-colored water is, the more difficult fish have seeing, and the easier it is to trick them into biting artificial baits. So all of that worked in my favor, and that's why I went up there. But that is a process that's pretty simple. And if you'll keep all that in mind, that you're looking for food, you're looking for cover, and then you're looking for the right lure to fish that cover. You know, every seminar I go to, people want you to pull a lure out of your pocket and say, if you'll buy this lure right here, you'll catch every fish in the lake. It's magic. You know, Forrest Gump had magic shoes. Uh, this is a magic bait. That ain't the way that it works. That's not the way it works. It's little things that you put together that make the difference in whether you catch fish or whether you don't catch fish. You know, I was at the Bassmaster Classic the other day, about two weeks ago. It was on Lake Hartwell, which is not far from where I live. And as all these guys took off, 50 couple anglers, 
If you could sit there and they boats went by and they were inspecting their boats, checking their live wells, making sure the aerators were, making sure they had all their safety equipment on, their kill switch attached to the to the life jacket, and as they came by, if you look, they all had the same lures. They all had basically the same lures. And here some of them caught just tons of fish and some didn't catch very many at all. But they all had the same baits. And these are all pro fishermen. What was the difference in a guy that had this bait and a guy that had that bait? What was the difference? Little things. Pay attention to detail. When I was just a kid, I, I, I loaded up my boat from South Carolina and went to, to Arkansas to fish my first $100,000 bass on Man, now, I grew up poor. Hundred grand is a lot of money. That could change my life. I was so excited about going to that tournament. When I got there, I went way up the river. I always like to get away from boats. People used to say I had a gasoline sponsor because I burned so much gasoline. I like to get away from boats. I don't like to have 15 boats in the same bay I'm fishing. That drives me crazy. And by the way, I'm going to say this for no extra charge. All this TV fishing, I love to watch it. I, I mean, I, I enjoy it. But it ain't okay to cut in front of another guy. That ain't okay. That ain't cool. That ain't good. If you're out fishing and a guy cuts around you, that's bad. Don't do that. I, I, I fished the other day on Lake Murray, and a guy pulled around me. I was headed to the back of the cove, and he pulled around me and cut in front of me. And I just put my troll over high. And I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I didn't realize that was you. I'm sorry. I, I'll get out of here. Well, wait a minute. It don't make any difference who I am. That's a rude thing to do. And they watch all this stuff on television and they think it's okay. It is not okay. Be courteous. There's sportsmanship and that, that, that's important. So I used to run a long way to get away from all the boats. Well, I go up into the river area and uh, I'm fishing and there's one other tournament boat up there. One other tournament boat. And when the tournament was over, the guy's name was Larry Nixon. And when the tournament was over, he won that tournament. He won that hundred thousand dollars. I finished fourteen. I won forty one hundred. He won a hundred grand. When it was over, I asked him. I said, "Larry, man, I would be coming in a cove, and you'd be going out. I'd be going out of a cove, and you'd come in. And what was your pattern? What were you doing?" He said, "Well, I was fishing the outside bushes, uh, pitching a jig." He said, I'd find these little drainage ditches where there would be a little wet weather creek and the bushes that were on the outside, the water was up, flooded. The bushes that were on the outside, the deepest bushes on those wet weather creeks, I, I was fishing those bushes that were on the outside and I was pitching them with a the jig. He said, what were you doing? I said, I was doing exactly the same thing. Exactly. I'd find those wet weather ditches. I was fishing the outside bushes. I said, what were you fishing with? He said, I was fishing with a jig. What were you fishing with? I said, I was fishing with a jig. He said, what color jig were you using? I said, I was using black and blue. What color were you using? He said, black and blue. I said, what weight jig were you having? He started laughing. He said, I was using a one ounce. Well, now the water's only two, two foot deep. He said, what weight were you using? I said, I was using a quarter ounce, and if the wind really got blowing pretty hard, I'd go to a half ounce. He said, well, did you ever have any big fish follow your bait up when you would lift it out of the water during practice? I said, not only during practice, I had it happen all during the tournament. I'd go to lift my bait out of the water really fast and five or six pounds would chase my bait. He said, that happened to me in practice. And he said, so I figured if they wanted that bait coming out fast, they wanted it going in fast. He said, I tied that big one ounce jig on and immediately started catching four or five pound fish. I never caught a four or five pound the whole tournament. So he was smart enough to connect the dots. He was smart enough to put that together. He figured out, hey, they're following that bait out fast. Maybe if I put on a heavier jig, they'll find it going in fast. 
and he won the hundred grand. He outsmarted me. I had the same data. I had the same information. That exact same circumstances were happening to me. I just wasn't smart enough to figure it out. That is the difference between winning and losing. Exactly the same thing that happened in the Bathmaster Classic. Now, they, all the anglers had the same lures. They're just one or two guys would figure out what is happening on the lake. So pay attention. There are no flukes. There is not something that just happens that won't reoccur. Pay attention to every little detail because that's the difference between catching fish and not catching fish. I tell people all the time, tournament fishermen are more knowledgeable and we need to learn from them. Now, I didn't say that we're better fishermen. There's a lot of great fishermen that will never ever fish in a tournament. But tournament fishermen are more knowledgeable because if you and your buddy, y'all fish a certain lake together, in your mind, you're either the best fisherman in the world and he's second, or he's the best and you're second. It's just human nature. You guys are great fishermen and you never have to be challenged. Well, you fish in a tournament, you feel the same way. You and your partner are great. You go out there and fish all day long and you don't get a bite. I mean, you don't get a bite. And so, hey, it was just a terrible day. Fish weren't biting. Just one of those days. And then you come to the weigh-in, and there's Larry Nixon up over 45 pounds. He's like, what in the world did I do wrong? So you learn. And the cool thing is you can go ask him what he did. You know what did not work, because you found that out with three days of fishing. And now you find out from him what did work. So your knowledge is incredible, what you learn, and what you learn the hard way, you don't forget. I had, uh, I had an experience, I wanted to be the first angler in history to win the Grand Slam. Nobody ever won the Grand Slam. I didn't know what the Grand Slam was, to be honest with you. We were fishing a Potomac River tournament, and uh, Ray Scott, the founder of Bass, uh, the Coast Guard came to him the second day of that event and asked him to cancel the, the competition for the second day of the tournament because of Hurricane Hugo. Well, there had never been a day that Bass ever canceled the competition. I mean, we fished in lightning, we fished in storms, and, and so there had never been a time we didn't fish, but he called it off because the Coast Guard asked him to. So we're all having breakfast. We're all gathered up. Roland Martin and Ricky Plunge over in the corner like two little schoolboys arguing over who's the greatest bass fisherman in the world. That was before Kevin Van Dam, by the way. Uh, but they're over in the corner, and they're arguing like two little kids. And Ray said, I'm going to tell you who's going to be the, the greatest fisherman in history, who's going to go down. And that's the guy that wins the Grand Slam. We're sitting there thinking, what is a Grand Slam? He said, well, that would be a qualifying tournament. That would be Bass Angler of the Year. That would be the Bass Master Classic. And that would be a super tournament. That's all of our events. Nobody's ever done that before. So I thought, huh. I'm going to be the guy to do that. So you only have one chance a year. I'd already won three of them. I'd won Angler of the Year. I'd won the Bassmaster Classic. And I'd won a qualifying tournament. But I'd never won a super tournament, the big money tournament. So I go to Lake Lanier and, uh, in Georgia. And that was where they had the super tournament that year. And Gary Klein from Oroville, California, uh, he jumped out to a big lead the first day. Well, every day I'd catch up with him a little bit. And the last day of the tournament, four-day tournament, the last day of the tournament, I came in with the biggest bag of the tournament. Ray Scott said, oh, the biggest bag of the tournament? Come here, Hank Parker, let's hold up these feet. And he held up two, and Dewey Kendrick was the waymaster. He held up two, and I held up one. And we walked up and down the stage, and got our that boys, and put them back in the bag, and waved them. Well, Gary Klein comes in. He's the leader of the tournament. Ray Scott says, you've got to have 10, 10 to win, 10, 9 to tie, put them on the scale. They weigh 10, 10. He beat me one ounce. So, but as fate would have it, the very next year, the Super Bass Tournament was on St. John's River in Florida, and I won it. So I became the first angler in history to win the Grand Slam, but that ain't the story. The story is the big money tournament, the one everybody wants to win, the Bassmaster Classic. So a couple of years later, we're on the James River. Same story. 
Jim Bitter jumps off to a big lead. Every day I kind of catch up. Last day I come in, Ray Scott says, Hank Parker, biggest string in the tournament. Let's hold him up. I said, nope, I ain't holding him up. Put him on scale. He said, it'd be a lot more dramatic if we'll hold those fish up. I said, it's plenty of drama for me like it is. <laughs> put them on the scales. So we put them on the scales. I won that tournament by two ounces. There is no way I'd have won that tournament if I'd have held up and let all the water drops come off those fish. <laughs> so lessons you learn the hard way are lessons you don't forget. You know? You, you learn. You learn from your mistakes. You learn some hard lessons you don't forget. And that's all fishing is. It's a learning process. Think in your lifetime how dramatic things have changed, how different you fish today than you did 30 years ago. Think about all the equipment that we have. Uh, John Powell, uh, late, great John Powell, Hall of Fame bass fisher. John Powell said in the beginning, you know, in the first couple of bass tournaments they had, there was not catch and release. They brought them in on a stringer. If you remember that first Bassmaster Classic at Lake Mead, Bobby Murray had them all on a stringer. Uh, and Ray Scott said, this is not right. We gotta figure out a way uh, to let these fish live and release them to the lake. So John Powell said, hey, I'm gonna tell you something. Catch and release will be the preservation of our sport, but it's gonna make fishing a lot different. Because once you catch and release fish for about four or five years, they're going to be a lot smarter. They're going to be a lot more difficult to catch. And I'm telling you, it, it is a lot different today than it was 20 years ago. Fish are harder to catch today than they were 30 years ago. And they'll be harder to catch tomorrow, so you've got to keep learning. And all these new techniques that we have are really, really important. And for to be hard-headed, will get you in trouble. My son came back from California. He had fished in a tournament in California. He came back with a drop shot. He said, Dad, we got a drop shot. You, you, you need to learn how to drop shot. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Show me how you do that. Mm -hmm. So you take your weight, you put your hook on the line, and then you leave your tag in, and you put your weight, and so you have your bait up above. It's a lot like a walleye. Something you guys are used to and been doing for 25 years. But you hook a little plastic worm on that, and then you got a drop shot. Nothing but a lindy rig, basically. So I go, and I said, I'm, I'm all in. But I ain't going to use that little bitty nose hook. That's ridiculous. I'm, I'm going to use a three or four all hook. I, I, I ain't going to try that little bitty baby hook. He said, no, Dad, you've got to use that little hook. You, you, I'm telling you, it makes all the difference in the action of that bait. That big hook's going to get you in trouble. I said, no. That big hook's gonna help me hook a fish. I'm not gonna use that little nose hook. So we go and we're fishing on Lake Lanier again down in Georgia. Well, 25 fish to zero, I change to the little nose hook. <laughs> it makes a difference. It makes a difference. And that little hook, it's amazing how it'll find its way in there and it doesn't come off. You know, if you set your drag, you use about eight pound test line, you catch them. But you look at all of that, well, what is a drop shot? Well, what is a spinner bait? Well, what is a a top water bait, what is a crankbait, what is a, a jig, what is a, a worm? It's a tool. It's a tool to do a job. We get all caught up as fishermen in, boy, well, that's a pretty bait. Look at the paint job on that bait. Let me tell you, if you had a leaking pipe at your house and you called a plumber, he'd come fix your pipe and he'd use a pipe wrench. He'd take the pipe under the sink, maybe put a new uh, uh, O-ring or something, but he'd take that apart with pipe wrench and he would work on your your pipe. He didn't really care what color that pipe wrench is. It, he's not all warm and fuzzy about his pipe wrench. And if you need to change your spark plugs in your automobile, you take it down to the mechanic, he'd use a plug wrench. And he really wouldn't care what color it was, he'd just use a plug wrench to take the spark plug back. Now, that plumbing tool, that pipe wrench, it wouldn't work to change your spark plugs. It's way too big to get down there to get those spark plugs loose. Nor would that plug wrench work to take the pipe under your sink loose. They're two different tools. Fishing lures are exactly the same thing. They're tools. And so you look at a fishing lure like a tool. 
Now, I'm up here today because of Plano Molding Company. I've worked with Plano uh, for, gosh, I'm, I hate to say, let me just say, I've worked with Plano since Bill Dance was in his 60s. <laughs> I've worked for Plano a long time. But uh, it's about organizing your tools. And so when you go to a certain place and you start to fish, you ask yourself, what tool do I have that would most thoroughly fish this structure? And you choose a fishing lure like that plumber would choose that pipe wrench to work on your. You choose the right tool. You know, we all get hung up on paint jobs and color. And if you're fishing and I'm fishing and we're going down a bank, and let's say you're catching a fish every cast. I'm looking over there and God, I haven't caught any fish at all. So we're meeting up together. And I say, hey man, how you doing? He said, I'm doing great, how about you? Well, I'm not doing so great. Uh, how many you caught today? I don't know, man, too many to count. What you catching them on? Catch them on a crankbait. What's the next question? What color? Let me tell you something. The, 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 what color doesn't matter, it's how deep is it running? What type of crankbait? What kind of structure are you fishing around? How fast are you fishing? All that's way more important than what color. So a lot of times we get our priorities out of balance when we select a tool or a lure to do a job. We gotta have the right bait to do the job. So I just challenge you to make it all simple. Don't, don't get so hung up in all the new techniques. Uh, be basic in understanding what you're looking for. You're looking for food, you're looking for cover, and you're looking for a lure that will fish that particular depth and that cover without hanging up or without getting grass on the bait. So you select the bait according to the conditions. And that's all it is to it, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're in Florida or whether you're in Green Bay, Wisconsin. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. And it's a matter of keeping it in perspective and choosing a bait to do a job. And if you can do that, you can catch fish. If you don't do that, sometimes you're just overwhelmed. You're out there spinning your wheels. And it's all a process of elimination. If you use this bait and you feel like it's doing a good job and it's not productive, then maybe you want to try something different, maybe a heavier jig. You know, but check it out. Check it out. Don't just automatically change. The, the one thing that I'm really excited about is high school fishing. Man, high school fishing is really a big deal. And I've been taking a lot of these kids, I've been going to speak to a lot of different schools, and I've talked to a lot of the different teams, and I've taken some of these kids fishing. Well, about four or five months ago, I took a kid fishing, and uh, you really had to grind it out. We were fishing in the river. Uh, there, was a, there was a bend in that river that had some stumps on a ledge about seven or eight foot deep, and the top of the, the ledge was just two or three foot of water. So you threw up two or three foot of water, and your objective was to drag that plastic worm down that drop off or that break, and then hit a stump. Once you hit a stump, you just slow down and just kind of finesse fish that worm. And boom, you catch a fish. And I was catching fish about every third cast, which is good. I, I'm really pleased with that. So I looked back there at my little high school buddy, and he started out catching them too, because he started out using exactly the same weight, uh, bullet weight on a Texas rig worm that I was using, the exact same worm. So I looked back at my little buddy, and now he's not catching any fish. And he's got every lure known to man laid out on that back. I said, buddy, what are you doing? He said, well, I thought they might hit this. Well, I thought they might hit that. Well, I like this. Have you seen this? I said, I've seen all that stuff. Man, why are you changing baits when you've got something that works? You know, the time you want to experiment with all that is when you're not catching them. But you're sitting here watching me catch a fish every third cast, and you're out here experimenting with different lures. Man, don't do that. If you get stuff that works, stay with it. And that's, it, that's how simple it is. It's a process of elimination, figure it all out, and presentation might be everything. But if I can stress one thing of importance, pay attention. Every little detail, pay attention. Because it makes a world of difference, the difference between catching fish and not catching fish. 
lot of people say, well, I'm not really interested in fishing tournaments. It's not that important. Well, hey, I don't fish tournaments either. Uh, I haven't fished tournament in 20 years. But whether you fish in a tournament or whether you fish for fun, I've learned that I fish a lot. And it's a lot more fun to catch them than it is not to catch them. So uh, I want to catch them every time I go. I have more fun when I catch them. Now, I still have fun. It beats a real job. I had a real job one time. I never wanted to know. Like I never got rid of it. But you can have fun, more fun catching fish. And I'm going to tell you, I look around and I see kids. I love kids. I like little people. My wife says I'm a, a little kid in an old man's body. And I think there's a lot to that. But these kids, when you take these kids fishing, let it be about them. Let it be totally about them. I highly recommend that mom and dad don't even bring your rods and reels. Let it, let it be about them. My kids, you know, they throw out there, we're fishing for bluegill. And I know if they'll let it sit there for another 30 seconds, they're going to get a bite. But they won't. They want to wind it in, throw it back. Let them wind it in, throw it back. It's about having fun. And the more fun you have uh, as a family, the more fun you have with your kid, the more apt they are to go back. And that's what we need. We need kids going back fishing. Fishing is important. My biggest fear with the high school fishing teams is they're learning so much from these telephones. You know, you can pull this up on the telephone and you can learn everything that is, every tournament Kevin Van Dam won. You can pull up the 1979 Bassmaster Classic. What Hank Parker won that tournament on. He was on Lake Texas that tells you what creek he was in. Tells you what lure he used. I had a high school kid tell me the other day, he said, Mr. Parker, I don't understand this. He said, I want you to explain this to me. He said, I read where Jason Quinn went to Lake Monticello and he said, I got his GPS coordinates, so I know I was exactly on the same point he was on. It told me the water temperature was 68 degrees, and Jason won that tournament with a huge bag of fish on this one point with this certain wiggle warp crankbait. And he said, I went there the other day, exact same time of year, exact water temperature, fish that exact point with that exact crankbait and I didn't get a bite. How could that be? I said, well, let's research that. Perhaps, I don't know this, turned out that later it was verified. I was just speculating. I said, perhaps Jason goes out there and he finds those fish on a jig or a worm on the break of that point. And during the tournament, the wind started blowing. And the wind created a little bit of mud cloud in the water. And the bait fish moved in that mud cloud, and that's why he caught. He used a crankbait to come through that mud cloud so it run four or five foot deeper. Before the wind started blowing, those fish were down there 18 or 20 foot deep. He said, oh, I never thought about that. Well, that's what you need to think about. You need to understand the basics, and you need to be able to expand on what the conditions dictate. You can catch fish up there in the shallows. I won that super bass storm I told you about on the St. John's River in Florida. Uh, because it was a four-day event. Three of the four days, we had really, really hard wind. It blew like 25 to 30. And so when that wind was blowing, I could bring that spinnerbait. The water was moving a lot. The waves were thrashing. And I could bring that spinnerbait through the eel break. And I was able to catch a big bag of fish. On the day, the one day we didn't have a wind, I had to fish a plastic worm because I couldn't get the spinnerbait through the eel break because it wasn't moving. The day I had to fish a plastic worm, I caught 11 pounds. The last day, the wind was going 25 to 30, I caught 38 pounds. So a lot of difference. But it was a tool to do a job based on the conditions. And that's the whole thing. If you figure that out, first of all, you've got to find the bait. Then you've got to get the right tool to fish the cover that's around the bait. Once you get that figured out, pay attention to details. They may want a heavier jig. Uh, they, they may want to fish slower. They may want a tight wiggling crankbait rather than a, a wide wiggling crankbait that disperses a lot of water. So there's a whole lot that can get complicated, but start off with the simple find the bait, find the lure to the fish the structure, make the presentation. And if you can keep it simple, it's a whole lot more fun. The great thing about fishing 
The greatest thing about fishing, my, my grandfather fished in the Okmuggie River in McCray, Georgia. He fished for red breasts his whole life. Red breasts is a fish that's like a, it's just like a perch and they only live in water that has a lot of currents, black rivers, and they're cool little fish, but it's really basically perch fishing. That's all he did his whole life, that's all he wanted to do. So you can grow, you can fish for different species, or you can be happy catching perch. It doesn't make any difference. That's the cool part about fishing. Uh, whatever you want to do, it, it's all out there. The main thing, whether you're a bass fisherman, whether you're a walleye fisherman, or whether you're musky fishing, man, make it fun. Make it fun. I look back over my career, and I think about how many neat things I was involved in that uh, passed the fun part back. You're so serious trying to make that check and make that bank payment that you forgot about how much fun you were having. So don't do that. Go out and have fun. Make fishing fun. And, and I'll tell you, a couple of really fun things happened in my life. Uh, as a tournament fisherman, we pass them by. And somebody asked me the other day, said, tell me some of the funny things that happened. And I said, well, I'll tell you one quick story. I went to Lake Texon, not Texon, I'm sorry, uh, Lake Texarkana. Uh, what is the name? Uh, Millwood, Millwood, Millwood Lake right out of Texarkana. And I went to Millwood Lake. And, uh, you know, when, when I would go fish for a tournament, I, I would always get there a day early. I would charter an airplane. I'd get air sick. I got sick every time I flew. But I chartered that airplane, we'd fly over the lake, and I'd make notes on a paper map. We didn't have Google Earth. We didn't have electronic maps that we plug into our Humminbird depth finder. It was a paper map. And so we marked, I'd mark in the airplane, I'd mark all these places. And the worst thing you could do is find fish the first day of practice especially a mother load of fish that could win the tournament because then you had to sweat it out all three days of practice on how many people were going to find those fish. So I go up, I fly an airplane, and I see this place, and I think, wow. If a man could figure out how to get up there, that's some good looking water, I think he could win the tournament. So you had to negotiate up the river and go around logs and rock piles and all kinds of stuff. So I got up the river, and uh, there was a set of rapids and that kept you from going any further. That was as far as you could go. And those fish were stacked up in those rapids. I thought, man, this is going to be awesome. So I, I go back down the river about 200 yards, and I think, how am I going to know whether somebody else finds these fish? So I had a little spool, a two-pound test trialing. So I got out on the bank, and I tied it to a willow tree. And I went all the way across the river, and I tied it to a willow tree on the other side. Now, if somebody breaks that line, I don't know they found these fish. So the last day of practice, most everybody's off the water by 3 o'clock because you've got to gas up your boat, get your batteries charged, and you have to go to a pairings meeting at 6 o'clock. So to get all that done, everybody's off the water by 3. So I wait till 3 o'clock, the last day of practice, and I go back up there. My line had not been broken. Ching, ching. I feel really good. So I take that line, wad it up, put it in my pocket, go on up, and I check, and the fish are still there. Man, I'm excited. I start back down the river, and there, <clears throat> there's a boat coming. And he's looking at me, and I thought, oh, no, that's a tournament boat. I just blew it. He don't know who I am, but he knows I'm a tournament boat. So he's going to come up here, and as soon as he comes up here, these fish are pretty aggressive. He's going to fight them. So I'm thinking, what can I do? What in the world can I do? So I trim my motor up. I start swinging water higher in the ceiling and shaking my boat like I'm hung on a rock pile. He looks and turns around and goes the other way. <laughs> so I go to the parents' partner party and I get my partner. My partner hadn't caught any fish. So the next morning he said, I'll do whatever you want to do. I had that ranger boat stretched out. We're running up that river and I get right there to that little place where I played that caper. And he grabs me by my collar and says, look out, there's a rock pile in here. <laughs> I never told him. <laughs> so there were a lot of fun things, a lot of fun times, and I look back, and I, I, I think more about the people uh, and the experiences that I had versus the wins and the, the terms. I've already spent that money a long time ago. I'm uh, 
my wife likes shoes, <laughs> pocketbook. Y'all have a belt, you know, to match. I tell all these young high school kids, you buy rods and real thing, you get married, you buy shoes and pocketbook. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a little bit like Roger Miller. I retired. People ask me all the time, say, Hank, why did you retire? And I think Roger Miller said it better than anybody. Roger Miller, the old country music singer, king of the road, uh, he retired. They asked him, they said, Roger, why did you retire? He said, well, you know, I worked hard all my life, and I made enough money to last me the rest of my life, providing I buy nothing big and die by Friday. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at. So uh, it's been a great career. I've loved it, and I'm really excited about seeing all these uh, young kids uh, uh, getting into the sport through high school fishing. And it is so exciting for me uh, to come to the northern part of America Fish. You guys don't realize, everybody talks about down south, talk about Florida. You guys got the best fishing in the world. Uh, there, there's no, uh, no lakes in the south that even come close to comparing to what you guys have. So enjoy what you have. The only thing you're limited on, on how many months a year you can fish. Uh, <laughs> hard to fish a bug bait when the ice is three feet deep. So. Uh, that, that is the only drawback, but when that ice is gone, what a great fisher you have. i got a few minutes. If anybody wants to ask me a question, I will tell you. I don't know how many minutes i got. i got about 12 minutes, I think. Uh, I'm a Christian, and I'm a fisherman. So my kids realized that a long time ago, and they allow me to embellish up to 50% without it being a lie. So when you ask me a question, I'll use my embellishment liberties the best I can to answer your question. But if anybody's got a question, I'll try to recognize that and, uh, and answer your question. Anybody, anywhere have a question? Well, I just want to say that you are a great man of integrity, and you have taught me more than well, that is awful. She said that I have taught her more uh, than just fishing. You know, life is like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. The Bible says that. And the older I get, the more I realize that. And so we need to cherish every moment that we have. And when we go out on the water, uh, I, I, I've been turkey hunting in the last couple of weeks, and I have a six-year-old grandson. And uh, just to spend time... Uh, with my, you know, I have five children, all girls, but four. And uh, just to spend time outdoors is so special. And it, you can instill values in your kids uh, in an atmosphere uh, in the outdoors that you can't do when you're trying to force it. You know, you're driving to school, you're trying to drive something, but when it's a relaxed atmosphere, it really helps you to communicate more with your children. Anybody else have a question? Yes, sir. Out of all the fishing experiences you've had, what is, what is the best memory? <laughs> Out of all the fishing experiences, uh, what is my best memory? I won that Bassmaster Classic on Jim Bitter. Uh, uh, he actually had a fish in the boat that would have won the tournament for him. And uh, he measured it on top of his tackle box where he had his measure board and it flipped back in the lake. <laughs> and so I did a seminar with him about a month or two after that tournament. And everybody said, man, that was awesome, that big string of fish you caught the last day to win the class. And of course, Jim's down in the dumps. And I said, you know, but that wasn't the smartest thing I did. The smartest thing I did that last day of the class is getting up at 3 o'clock in the morning and slipping to the boatyard and putting that graphite oil on Jim Bitter's bed. <laughs> <laughs> so I've had fun with that story over the years. But it, it's so many. It's hard, hard to narrow it down to, to one thing. I, I will tell you this. I took my grandson fishing one day, and we were shooting a television show, and we were going to catch bluegill on the bed. And I kept telling him, I said, Alec, you need to throw right up here where you can see this water. It's dark water. And I said, it kind of looks red. That's where he said, no, Papa, I'm going to throw out here. I said, no, buddy, that's in the middle of the lake. You're not going to catch anything in the middle of the lake. You need to throw up here. And he said, how do you know, Papa? I said, buddy, your Papa is a two-time world champion. Trust me, I'm telling you, you need to throw up here. 
So he said, but I want to, I said, okay, you throw out there. He threw out there and he called it a huge blue bill. He said, see, Papa, here's where you need to be fishing. <laughs> we caught all of our fish in the middle of the lake. So sometimes what you know, it, it doesn't always work out. But anybody else have a question? Yes, sir, buddy. What about when you're fishing for bass, you end up catching walleye or pike? I love to fish for bass, and I'm smallmouth is my favorite, and I've caught uh, walleye while I was bass fishing. I did a show with Randy Amaru. I don't know if you remember Randy Amaru, but he was a great walleye fisherman. Him and Gary Roach put to, together a television program called Promos. And uh, I was fishing on Randy Lake uh, with Randy Amaru. And we were using our hummingbird electronics and we go over and we're fishing this little island and we are marking these walleye and we stopped and we're catching walleye. And I throw out this side on the other side of that rock island with a jig and I caught about a four pound smallmouth. And I said, you see what that means, don't you, Randy? He said, yeah, it means the walleye on this side of the island and the bass are on this side. I said, no, it means the walleye show is now over. <laughs> We're going to catch the bass. <laughs> so, whatever species you prefer. Anybody else have a question? Yes, ma'am. The, the three states I've never fished, I've never fished uh, North Dakota. Uh, I have never fished uh, Montana. And I have never fished uh, uh, Washington State in the state of Washington. I'm going to do that and get that off my bucket list. I had never fished Maine, but I went last year and fished Maine and had a great time. I went to Maine last year, and I just had no agenda. I just started fishing different lakes in the state. And what an incredible fishery. Uh, the state of Maine, they got lakes and like second to Minnesota, I think it got 8,000 lakes. So, and I had so much fun to have a lake on Moosehead. And God, um, I didn't catch, but see, I caught 10 smallmouth on that lake in a day, in all day fishing. But they were all 10 over 5 pounds. It was really incredible. Anybody else have a question? We got to go. Have you ever caught a fish bringing it in and another fish grabbed it? Have I ever caught a fish bringing it in and another fish grabbed it. I was fishing in Baccarat, Mexico, Lake Baccarat, which is one of my favorite lakes in the world. I wouldn't go there now. My buddy that uh, had introduced me to Baccarat was a super guy named Felipe, and he was actually shot and killed oh. by the drug cartel for turning them in for growing drugs around Baccarat. What a great fishery if we ever get that wall built and get all that straightened out, maybe it'd be a good place to go back to. But I was at Baccarat, and her question was, have I ever had a fish uh, as I was bringing in another fish crab? I was fishing at Baccarat, and I pitched a jig into a bush, and I hooked about a three pound bass. And my cameraman, back in those days, we used videotape. My cameraman said, up oh, my tape's down, let me change tape. Well, it takes about 10 seconds to change tape. So I just held that fish there in the bush. So when he got his tape changed, he said, okay, I'm back up. I started to bring the fish in, and he was hung up. I couldn't hardly move. So I started pulling and pulling and pulling, and I realized then a bass had eaten my three-pound bass. Now, this bass was gigantic, maybe a world record. I mean, this bass was a huge bass. So I pulled him out of the bushes, and I realized it. Then I was trying to let him eat the bass where I could hook him because I knew I couldn't get a hook in him. So he came off right at the top of the water and I'm looking at the camera and I said, did you get that on film? He said, I got a little bit of it. And while I was talking, he came back and got it again. So that time I really tried to feed it to him, but I got it about halfway back to the boat and it came off. So I have had that happen. You guys are absolutely great. I'm gonna go over here and sign some autographs so come by and see me. Uh, go buy you a Plano tackle box. They paid for my trip to come up here and talk to you guys. They're a great company. And you guys were awesome. Thank you so much.